Hey, where did he disappear? Oh, I've got to me. I didn't have leather. Yes, no, you had me. Remember, I was the first one to be filmed. Did she? No, look at me. It's my eyes. You're on candid camera. And who is that? Who is that? <laughs> it's to me. That's to it. That's me. It. I think um, I wanted to be remembered for who she was and uh, I don't think many people have had the opportunity to know who she was because uh, at age 20 you haven't really come through to really shape exactly who you are or so. But looking back at her life, we can piece together her life in order to tell her, stor her story that would make people to remember her as somebody who was very caring, someone who was very confident of herself, someone who wanted to do good for others. And um, that's how I wanted to be remembered. I never saw New York as home. I never saw her see New York as home. I knew she saw South Africa as home and I knew that's where she wanted to be. And I know personally that's where I would end up, whether going back in the same way as her or going back alive. That's where I want to be and I've made it very clear. Where her ashes are, that's where mine are going to be, next to her. So, that's home for me. To me, was just the most remarkable, remarkable human being from, from the day she was born. Just, just remarkable. I mean, growing up, she was a really sensitive child. Very, very sensitive. And in many ways also didn't show her sensitivity. You know, she would hide it as well. She was a very private person. In many ways like, like her mother. Let's go today. Let's go today. Hello. Let's go today. Do you have me too? Hmm? Oh, mm. just my hand. No, just your hand. I met Tabuho in 19... It was 1985 um, at, at the university. It's interesting because at that stage I... Uh, we weren't even sure about each other, you know. Um, but but f from there the relationship developed. I was already involved in politics. He wasn't involved in politics. And uh, he used to tell the story how one time I said to him that uh, politics come before my family. And I meant it. I felt the politics came before that in terms of me being able to make, create a better world for my family. My colleagues actually ended up in political positions, top political positions, and I chose not to. And uh, again, it was a personal choice that Politics are not going to be my career, but I would, write, I would like to continue in education and still get involved. That in itself was a challenge because I got married to a white person under apartheid, which made the marriage in some ways illegal. Certainly, we, you know, we were aware, I think Taboka's parents were very anxious about, uh, you know, marrying a uh, a white man or having a relationship with a white man you know they, they were concerned about this and I said you know if the relationship uh, doesn't work the reason the relationship won't work is because of our you know conflict within the relationship it won't be because of because of race she was to me through her whole life from an early age was a caretaker 
So when, when Lemahang was born, uh, it, you know, there wasn't that sister-brotherly uh, rivalry. There was, there was this, this love, this deep love that she had and excitement that she had for Lemahang. A lot of people used to think that me and Timmy were twins. We got asked that question quite often and we're only two years apart. I don't know how dependent she was on me, but I, I was extremely dependent on her for the support and, you know, that's what I knew. She was my only sibling. And she caretakered him and helped bring him up, you know. Uh, uh, we always used to joke that, you know, Timmy was the, the leader and, and we'd always say, there goes Kinko. Hello. You know, with the apartheid ending, it sort of really, it was a sort of cork, you know, which and the champagne bottle just exploded. I had been so involved in South Africa and I needed a break and I couldn't see myself taking that break within South Africa. It wasn't possible to take that break. Then I got an offer with NYU. I was made an offer, told the family and everybody got excited, wanted to come. So that's when we returned to New York. Hope, this is for you, my man. This is my kind of time. I knew that once I'd left South Africa, I couldn't go back. And let's just take a last view out here and see what New York is like at night time. Oh, this is all our apartment block and there we're looking at the other buildings. It was just incredible to feel safe, uh, to not River, to worry about side, protecting east. the family at uh, night time in terms of whether there will be you know, whether we'd be burgled, somebody attacking us in, in the house. You know, the crime uh, had, was, was so bad in South Africa towards the end when we, when we left. And, and those were some of the motivations for, for me also to leave. Uh, what I love about them is that this is, this is what we call a serious fight. Initially, when we first both moved to New York, um, we be, were very close and I stayed here with her. And then I went back to South Africa. And our relationship evolved differently because she fell deeply in love with New York and I, I wasn't too keen on the prospect of living here. I think uh, she came of age in New York. She blossomed in the middle school where she was. She realized that uh, there were less limitations on her life and uh, less limitations in terms of what she can do, what she can achieve. But she never looked at it as her final destination. She always looked at it as a means to her destination, which was South Africa. She always felt that she was South African, very strongly so. Uh, but she was certainly influenced by, by her life here and her friends. Uh, I think her friends had a very Im big impact on her here. Growing up, I grew up with Timmy. That's, there's no question about it. And so it's like so many of our first experiences with the world, in fact, I would say, we shared. And we confronted um, deity together, family hardships, you know, boyfriend hardships, and just all of that stuff. We did that all together. People would always think that me and Tumi were sisters, which was funny, um, because everyone knew I had a younger sister, and it, they assumed it was her instead of my actual sister. We had certain things that were more similar um, than her and Kendra. Like, I think we were a bit more um, maybe politically inclined sometimes, so like we would kind of annoy Kendra if we were talking about things, I don't know, that like Kendra didn't want to talk about. <laughs> I don't know, I've always sort of thought of her as like my anchor, you know. I think she definitely changed me in that, like, she helped me to care more about the rest of the world. And Tumi had always wanted to be <laughs> the president of South Africa. I'm, I know that Tumi had the drive in her. She had the potential and she had the brains and she had what it takes. 
There's such great work that can't be done now because she's been murdered. Police say 20-year-old Boydamello McCallum was last seen alive at a party at her mother's apartment here at 4 Washington Square Village. Her body, badly decomposed, was discovered Monday. The victim was last seen on August uh, 2nd. The party, August 1st into August 2nd. She was seen on August 2nd. Her mother, an NYU professor, was in South Africa at the time. Police were able to confirm the victim's identity Tuesday. The victim has been identified positively as a result of fingerprints provided by the South African Embassy. Police say they're investigating the death as a homicide, though the medical examiner has not yet determined exactly how McCallum died. There's some damage to the face, uh, possible there might be a fractured nose. Uh, that is still to be determined as to what the, the cause of death is. The Boko to me is like a sister. And, and to me, is like my daughter too. So when, when we heard of her death, it was really, really trying. It, it was scary because I knew that Deboha was back in South Africa. And at the same time, we're not certain whether it was indeed uh, Buitumelo until we, you know, got the, um, um, the fingerprints that the police uh, wanted to get from ourselves to ensure that indeed it was her. I was uh, in South Africa and uh, I got this phone call which uh, told me that a body had been found in my apartment. And I said, what apartment? I mean, it was like, it wasn't even clicky, it doesn't make sense. And they say here in New York and I recognized that it was somebody from the university, my dean. The reception wasn't very good in the place where we were. It was a cell phone. But at that very moment, I knew that my daughter was dead. When my dad got the phone call, he was in, he was in his bedroom, and I, I sort of could sense something was wrong, just, you know, the tone of his voice. But I wasn't too sure what it was, you know. And so he got the news first, and, and then he called me into his room. And I got into his room and he was ready in tears, so, you know, I sort of, he almost didn't have to say anything, he just said my daughter, you know, and I already knew what, what was wrong, you know, and yeah, so we cried for, you know, we cried basically the whole night, we didn't sleep, we just cried, we cried and cried. It, it, it was a nightmare, a nightmare. I mean, to me, it was the closest thing to me in my life. I, the, lo the loss is, is, is unbearable, absolutely unbearable. I mean, it's still, it's still uh, just something that I, I can't comprehend, you know. It, it, I didn't know whether it was suicide murder, accident, I, I, I had no idea. The police wouldn't tell me, they wouldn't say, they said you need to, you know, just come and we'll, we'll talk about it. They just said something about this, some suspicious circumstances. Either there was like a fire or something, which would have been like the best case scenario, I guess. Or like she could have killed herself, or somebody killed her and it was a random person, or Mike killed her. And even though I kind of had all these other scenarios in my head, I had this really just kind of fear at the pit of my stomach where I was like, God, I hope it's not Mike. Police say they're searching for McCallum's boyfriend, 23-year-old Michael Cordero. They say his last known address is 90 Amsterdam Avenue. They won't call him a suspect, but they say they'd like to speak to him. Well, me and Mike, what it is was that we would chill. We would chill a lot. He had his own crew, but then I had my own crew. But then we always linked up, you know, because we from the same block and we did the same stuff. So 
We would basically be chilling all the time. And he was a real quiet kid, and he was really humble. I still remember uh, very well when I met him coming back from South Africa, getting off the plane after a 17 hour flight. I was meant to meet with Dumi at the airport and she came rushing, meeting me when I got off the plane and she was with Mike who I was meeting and hearing about for the first time. I took one look at this guy and I knew I didn't like him. They met at a party. They ended up sitting at the same couch at one point because they were both tired from dancing, I guess. I guess she was like kind of like uh, laying on him. He asked for her number. She gave it to him except for the last digit. And then like, I don't know how long it was, like maybe like a year later, Timmy and I were walking down the street. We were at Beacon and we were going to the store and uh, we ran into this kid who is Mike and um, he asked for the last digit and she gave it to him. That story alone tells me that's the kind of guy Jimmy didn't want to date and tried getting rid of by giving the wrong number. You don't forget a number that easy if you are interested in somebody. And thereafter, he would call her very often and uh, she would tell me how they'd have conversations for like six hours and stuff and he would just, he would just listen. And I guess I think that's why she fell for him because he was someone that really sought to please her. Well, one day she just kind of told me, you know, that uh, that she had she had this boyfriend and uh, and uh, that she yeah she you know had feelings for him and so I said, well, you know, bring him around. Let's let's meet him and. Uh, he seemed very nice. I mean, in the first, my, you know, first impression. I mean, it wasn't. It certainly he wasn't the kind of person I expected to me to, to sort of go out with. I think a mother has got a sixth sense, and maybe that's what I'm going around not getting to. I knew there was something not right. It was an intuition, and I had hoped it wasn't going to last. Whereas I knew that he wasn't certainly from from our kind of background in terms of experience and and, and, and life. I, w I mean, I've always taught to me, and I think as a family, we to walk and I, we both, you know, that in terms of not being prejudiced, not you know, I mean, it doesn't matter who we are. I mean, if we if we're loving people and 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 kind and you know, you, you know, it takes all kinds to make a world. The kind of family she was raised with, we didn't make a distinction class-wise and all that in terms of friends and people who came into the house and people we got involved with and so on. And for me, I think that's why she didn't see anything wrong in, even in a relationship, getting involved with somebody like Mike and thinking, that's okay. If he's right, if his heart is in the right place, you take them as somebody who just has been unfortunate not to have that because she always emphasized that part has been unfortunate, lost parents, lost that, and so on. And she wouldn't see the other side. I don't know, Mikey likes that, those, those kind of girls, you know, like then Mikey had, you know, his project side, you know, because he grew up here, so maybe the girl liked that, and, you know, I can see why he likes her, because he kind of, you know, he was real educated, you know, he wasn't no ignorant person, he wasn't, he wasn't like one of those, those tough guys, you know, he was, he was real open-minded. Around that time, you know, he started to drift away from us, and I guess spend more time with his girl, which I figured because whenever he has a girl, he's always with them, you know? And he seemed like a, like a really good boyfriend, you know? Like, he didn't seem like an abusive one, you know? He seemed like a really good one. I like to spend time with them. He seemed a bit like he wasn't going anywhere in life. He wasn't involved in any work-orientated things, or he wasn't trying to get work. It just looked like he was just 
living. He was just a person. He was, you know, not a bad person, not a good person. He was just there. I mean, he was always talking about getting a job, for instance. So I said, well, you know, you've got to build a resume and things like that. I, in some ways, I thought, well, let me support him. I mean, while he's going out with Timmy, let me see what I can do to kind of help him and, and things like that. But he never really wanted it. I wasn't interested in early relationships because I felt they're not going anywhere, so I don't want to invest in being involved. So that was my attitude even with Mike. But one of the things that I noticed and uh, I was un uncomfortable with was the fact that uh, there were too many phone calls from him. I, I s and I, I'm the one that paid the telephone bill. I saw that he phoned her every 20 minutes, every 40 minutes. Uh, I think emotionally, it, it was a lot for Timmy to, to, to bear. She never had to do any of the work. I mean, he went after her. He went after her th full throttle, you know? I mean, he would not leave her alone. It's, I mean, it was scary sometimes. You know, it's obviously, like, he needed something. Like, he needed some type of affection. And he wanted to be like, he wanted like, I guess to feel like some self-worth. He had a family, but he didn't have the perfect family. Like his father, like I said, he's, um, he's homeless. You know, you, sometimes you catch, catch him drifting around the block, you know. He wasn't really much of a father, you know. They had to support him. I don't think he was looking for a family. He was looking for a ticket out of his own situation. You know, she had like, I heard she had like a lot of resources, you know, she knew a lot of people and stuff. As to us, we, we didn't really know anything, you know, we just, we just lived daily, you know, doing stupid stuff. I could see it was upsetting my dad and it's upsetting my mom that she was dating him and I, I just couldn't understand why she wanted to date him. I think she was more of desperate to be in a relationship and I think what was framing a lot of that was her own personal disappointment given what was happening in the family. The family had just broken up. My parents were getting divorced. I, I couldn't be bothered. I, my dad found new love. You know, that's, that's correct. That it didn't bother me. But for her, it was, she didn't look at it that way. She took it a lot harder than I did. And she cried way more than I cried. And, I, was, I felt very distant from it and it didn't affect me in a bad, bad way. I, I was just unhappy about them, the way that they were treating each other, my parents. Maybe she looked for a substitute and that was the only substitute available at that time. Showing the love, being obsessed with you. If your father is not there, your mother is sitting there, miserable, depressed over a broken marriage then here I am to cheer you up and uh, to be in your life or so. I'm sure she did feel a little alone. I mean, from being, having a sibling around all the time, all of a sudden the sibling's now gone to board, boarding school in South Africa. Then her parents get divorced and she, she, I'm sure she did lose quite a, a large of her support group, you know? She didn't, she didn't have that anymore. So I think she was just looking for some sort of support, not, not necessarily a father figure though. I gave too many reasons as to why why I left, but but I um, I felt that also there were things that were private between Tabuhu and me in terms of why uh, why I left that relationship, and I, I felt it she just wasn't ready to to hear that, uh, and I did I, I didn't I didn't want to bring Tabuhu down. You know, I mean, there's two sides to every relationship and what goes on in there, it's only those two people know it.
I want to believe that she genuinely fell in love with him, thinking that that's the right guy. But at the same time, she was realizing certain things that maybe he's not quite right. She was very torn. And I think at the same time that she was attracted to him, she was torn. I mean, I became aware that he was a, an obsessive personality, that he wasn't leaving her alone. Uh, when I was um, uh, when I was in Oakland, uh, uh, the one week I, I spent with her, uh, when she was at, at Mills uh, College, he, he kept on phoning her the whole time. And the one time we drove from Oakland all the way to, to San Francisco, he was on that phone and was accusing her of having an affair with somebody else. I thought it was really interesting that she went all the way to California for college. I think she definitely wanted to get away from him. I think that she had her own space there, not just him, her parents, all the drama that was in New York. I mean, I think in a lot of ways she really found herself and in college, um, she was doing really well academically um, and she was really involved with Justice Now. She was doing a lot of work for women prisoners. She would be so thrilled each time telling me what she has done and uh, how she has helped somebody who was losing weight, couldn't eat because the prison was in letting her teeth fixed and she has written letters. So she had that streak of wanting to help, of wanting to do something good for somebody. In, in that time, I really noticed a, a real shift into me. You know, that she was looking at California even uh, as, as making a new home there. Um, we, at, at the, at the non-profit she was working at, she said, you know, wow, this is my life. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I would talk to her almost every day. She would be telling me about the paper she's working on. I would say, send it to me. I'll read it quickly for you just to see if it makes sense. and. Life was going on, but she wasn't talking about what was happening, that she was having Mike's company. And I didn't know that Mike was in California. I didn't even think that he could go to California. I did hear at one stage that Tumi used her little pocket money to buy Mike a ticket, as an example, to go to California and things like that. So I think in his own mind, it was like, his life is sad if he stays in that, but he blew it in another way because he just didn't fit in it. He definitely felt very threatened, I mean, obviously, and knew that things were not the same. She, she wasn't in love with him in the same way anymore. In that discomfort, they had a little tiff, and he threw to me onto the ground they were outside the residence, sort of grabbed her arm and threw her on the ground. Students in the, in the residence, they, they heard her screams and shouts. She was trying to escape from him. And uh, they came to her rescue. They had to throw him out. Uh, one chap actually had a crowbar. He said he almost physically had to use the crowbar to get, to get him away from Toomey. I mean, he wanted to kill her. He took Jimmy's passport, Jimmy's cell phone, Jimmy's ticket for coming home because he was getting ready to come home, and so on, and just left. So um, Jimmy called and told her father. This was a great concern to me. And I, um, you know, I seem to remember, I think I even I contacted the police myself, I asked them, I tried to get them to, to stop him and arrest him at the airport. Um, they said they wouldn't do that until Timmy laid a charge, Timmy refused to lay a charge. I couldn't try to convince her, couldn't get her to do that. Father went to the airport to meet him because he knew which flight was coming on Mike met Mike at the airport and confronted him. Uh, he got a shock. He was really f scared when he saw me. I mean, he, uh, his body was shaking physically. Uh, I told him, um, you know, well, certainly what he had done was inexcusable. I tried to get Timmy's passport from him, or where are they, you know. He denied having taken it. 
He denied having beaten her up. And I said, you know, there were witnesses, where people actually had, you know, he denied everything. He just, he lied about it all. Uh, but I told him that the relationship was over. Tumi didn't want to see him again and uh, that he needed to move on with his life. That was it. The relationship was over. I encouraged that. I kept on take, talking to her, saying that if the guy has done it once, he's going to do it again. Don't get tempted to get back to him, no matter what apologies and so on. Uh, she broke up with him, and um, my dad changed her, her cell phone number. He phoned me, I think, two days afterwards, too wanting to speak to Tumi, and I said, well, she doesn't have a phone, she's not contactable, she doesn't want to see you. I said, move on, move on with your life. Uh, she'd come up to visit me that earlier on that summer. We had such a great time, and this is when she was like totally, totally done with Mike, and she was so free and so happy. I talked to Lebo, the younger brother, about it, who knew Mike and had seen Mike before they had hung out together when he was here and said, wow, that's the news everybody has been waiting for. We're so happy that he's out of your life, and you know, we finally, the, uh, uptown, she threw a birthday party in you, and you know, they had a great time. Michael was out of the picture, was, you know, everybody was sort of in a, in a happier state, you know. There wasn't that sort of uncomfortable awkwardness about him, you know, or he, was, he just wasn't in the picture anymore. What we didn't know was that it wasn't over with Mike. Police say 23-year-old Michael Cordero confessed to killing his 20-year-old girlfriend after an argument Friday and leaving her body here inside her mother's apartment. They say he was distraught as he outlined what happened detail by detail at Roosevelt Hospital, where he was taken after attempting suicide. Police charged Cordero with murder in the second degree on Wednesday, hours before the medical examiner determined the cause of death. 20-year-old Boitumelo McCallum was strangled and then smothered with a towel over her face. Cordero was transferred to Bellevue and will be under supervision until Friday. Police say that's standard after suicide attempts. The Manhattan District Attorney's Office says they're drafting a complaint charging him with the murder. He'll appear in court after he's released from the hospital. Solana Pine, New York One. Well, at first, I didn't even believe it was him. You know, I thought they were talking about somebody else because I could not see that happening. When he did it, you know, he was, he was free for a few days. Like, they didn't catch him for like a week or so. So people started telling me that his characteristics started to change. You know, he was, he was real ir irritable, you know, like her lashing out at people because people were trying to like, you know, get him arrested and stuff. And they were, showing, they were telling me that he had another side to him you know, he, that he tried to kill himself. What happened was he saw the cops and um, he ran to his building. You know, I guess because of the heat of the moment, he didn't know what to do, so he cut his wrists. You know, I guess because he didn't want to get caught, he just wanted to, you know, I guess he just wanted to let, his, like, let go of his life right then and there. And you know, he was running with, with, with bloody wrists and that's probably how he got caught, you know, because I think he just, he just got fatigued, you know, by Western Beef. When I came out on the floor to start doing my work, I saw some policemen running through this whole store with the gun drawn saying that they're looking for somebody, a Spanish guy came in here. And they asked me if I see any Spanish guy coming by this way and I tell them, well, he just went to the restroom. He asked me to use the restroom and I let him use the restroom. And they told me he was a criminal. He killed his girlfriend. I said, I didn't even know that officer. <laughs> and he tried to run this way, passed by the milk section and then the police officer blocked him. And they put him against the wall and they handcuffed him. I felt that was part of the staging. He knows how to kill. He knows how to kill himself. If he was remorseful, he wouldn't have left this building. He would have jumped off this building. He wouldn't have run up the building where he was accosted with blood dripping. He would have jumped from that building. He knows how to kill and he knew how to kill himself and he had three days to do it and he didn't do it so I don't see any remorse. I think he's sorry, sorry for himself though, you know, he's sorry that he, he's sorry for himself because now he's, he's probably killed the only person who is reaching back out to him so I guess he, he's not remorseful for what he did, he doesn't care about 
what he's doing to the family or what he's what effect it has on me or my mother or my father you know but he he is remorseful for the effect it's having on him now that he doesn't have anybody reaching out to him anymore and he doesn't have that support that she used to give him but there's no way he's sorry for for what he did to us evidently what was happening is that he started communicating with her on facebook and and she was just ignoring him ignoring him ignoring him but he's an obsessive personality he didn't give up and she responded i mean he found out she was home so he had called the house phone and they had talked on the phone um you know and he knew that her parents weren't going to be home and that you know she was probably in more of a you know vulnerable state maybe walking down the passage to the apartment you know uh, i get angry emotions you know what was going through his head when he was thinking you know i'm going to go into this apartment and murder her you know i don't feel it was a mistake that uh, he killed her barehanded it was more of not having a weapon as proof that uh, he didn't come to kill her but he left home coming here to kill her i i really i i think i know it was an accident you know cuz he wouldn't he wouldn't intentionally do that like you know like he wouldn't intentionally kill her like that i can tell you for sure he, there's no way he didn't premeditate he was he, he, his intentions were quite clear i've seen um pictures that he's drawn very violent pictures with a, a picture of him holding up a head that's been decapitated and the head is what resembles to me i went crazy i went absolutely crazy because then it was the comprehension of and i still i still can't go there and uh i'm still convinced he's you know he's lied about the process of how he did it i just didn't think that might could possibly be back in her life like i mean she changed her phone i mean if i had thought that there is a connection to mike then i would have probably blamed him as the culprit but i just um i assumed that there was no way he i didn't know where he was living he's living on the streets again and yeah i'm sure she felt sorry for him she thought she could save him she really really did and i i mean i'm sure at times she did I'm sure she really did at times. But in the end he could not handle her not wanting to be with him any longer. I realized that um when they broke up that he had nothing. I mean there was nothing but to me. And if he couldn't have her, you know, nobody else was going to have her. I know. I remember one time talking about it with Kendra and her kind of joking around being like, yeah, if they but if they break up he's going to kill her. I didn't think that it'd be somebody that would kill somebody. Um you know you I mean I the, and I was on the lookout for that. And I thought that we'd nabbed it in the bag. We thought that I thought that that was over and I was continuing to monitor it. And she kept on saying no she wasn't seeing you know it was over. Uh because if if I would have not allow I mean I would have interfered. There was no ways. We I mean we talked to her several several times. um asked her you know why she was with him asked her why she, you know why she wouldn't break up with him and you know you can only warn them so much a person's going to do what a person's going to do you cannot live someone else's life for them a lot of what ifs you know you know i i would just hear a summer earlier and you know i knew I didn't like this guy i knew he wasn't a great influence in her life you know and i so you know but I just let it happen anyway so I let them just continue to go out or you know I could have done something or there was a lot of those type of questions you know and I don't think you know you'll ever get over not blaming yourself you know having stopped it yeah, I think that that guilt stays with you for life you know I mean Michael was not some distant figure he was somebody who was living stay you know breathing eating amongst us he was somebody who was here with us he was somebody we could have shut out of her life way early on before he became so obsessed and we could see you know the patterns and i think that's something you just you live with i didn't really let myself um believe that mike 
could be capable of something like that. And I obviously regret that now. I, I regret not being more of a parent in our friendship, but I guess that's not really what friends are for, so. I don't know, I mean, I think that I was always scared for her, but more, and I think I could definitely see that it was a really controlling relationship, but it's difficult because, you know, when they were together, he was just so, like, lovey-dovey and whatever, and, you know, writing her poetry. You know, as you can see me, like, I, I tried to come out, you know, I didn't want to get sucked in by, this, by these projects. You know, they say these projects is a big curse, you know, everybody in here always ends up, like, doing something crazy or, you know, ending up being, like, messed up in the future. So, for Mikey to try to find an outlet out was only natural, you know, we all, we all did, you know. Like, you can see me, like, I, I can't be in here. <laughs> if I stayed in here, you know, I would, I would still be in jail, you know, so I had to get out. There's no day that goes by without me thinking and reflecting and wondering and anger and so on. And uh, the strange thing is also, I mean, there are lots of people when I walk around that remind me of both. I walk around, I see people who resemble Mike and that just comes, or I walk around, I see kids that are the same age as her, young girls, or almost looking like her sometimes, and I just get that pain. So, that constant reminders. I mean, more than that, I feel like it's just kind of had such a rippling effect on so many other things, and, you know, it's the way that it's affected her family, my family, you know, I don't want to say it's like destroying us, but like it's just like, I don't know, we'll never be the same. With the loss of Timmy, I, I, I kind of fell apart a little bit too, you know. Um, I mean, I knew that I had to get myself together and, and, and that, you know, that the loved ones around. But I mean, my initial thing, of course, is I, I yeah, I you know, didn't want to live. I mean, there were those moments of just when, you know, I just wanted to give up. I guess I also look at New York as, a, as, as the fault of all this, you know, if my family had never come to New York, this never would have happened, you know. She wouldn't have been in this apartment by herself, you know, with a madman. You know, I would have been, if I'd never moved back to, New, to South Africa, I would have been here in New York, I would have been hanging out with her, you know, I would have been around, you know, but you know, wouldn't, wouldn't let that just happen, you know. And that's why I sort of blame it on, on New York. I wanted to come here, give them an opportunity, let us live somewhere else, let us do something different, let me get out of all the political work that I was involved with in South Africa. It was the right thing to do, in the same way that it was right at that time to expose everybody to life and world beyond South Africa. I don't regret that part of it. Timmy always um, looked at herself as a, as a South African child. She, she loved New York, but she was a, a South African child, you know. And uh, my cousins and everybody back home, we only, we only saw her 
maybe once a year, maybe once every two years, you know. So I don't think it's really sunk in back home yet. Maybe they're still waiting for you know to get off that flight and walk in at Johannesburg Airport and and come come and greet them, you know. They're still almost in denial, denial back home. The arrangements made was to have to have a body being shipped back to South Africa. And what was said about that journey was that she came to the US in the plane, sitting in the, in the plane, in the passenger seat. She went back as cargo in the bottom, and I was on the same plane. And the whole journey was just tough. We did agree that to, to have it in South Africa. I mean, it becomes a whole African sort of thing in, in, in terms of the, the, the rituals and the processes and, and, and things. And, you know, even Timmy's funeral, I mean, it was, it was, it was very beautiful. It was hard to bury a child for any parent. It's very, very difficult. But in terms of making arrangements and the family and friends, everybody rallying around that, it was very easy. I mean, there are things I would have liked differently. I think the tension between Tabuha and me was became very heightened uh, during that. Uh, it was it became extremely difficult. So uh, yeah, there was an added pain to it. So this is Jimmy's fifth birthday party. Yeah. He's now five years old. Can we sing? Happy birthday. It's been a spiritual journey for me, and in that way, I've I've linked to me through 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 dreams. Um, I had the most intense dream about. It was during during the summer where um, she she came to me in, in in the dream, and we you know we used to we used to hold each other for minutes on end when she was alive. And uh, in the dream she came and we, we just, it was like so real. She, we held each other. It was, it was just so amazing. And, and she said, you know, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm actually okay now. Uh, and, I've, and I've passed on, you know, I've, I've passed through. And, it was, it was, I suppose, in some ways, some sort of closure. But I, I remember not wanting to let go, you know. Uh, I think it's more of just a denial that she's gone, more than she cannot watch over me. It's more like my child is not gone. She's not on that side yet. I believe that, I'm sure, I'll reach one day a stage where I believe she's gone and I believe that she's now watching over me. But for now, it's still part of that denial. One of the things that I still hold on to is more of her bedroom. Her bedroom meant a lot to her. And I feel this is the bedroom she chose when she got here. And ironically too, that's exactly the same place where she left this earth and left New York. So it holds a special place for me. And here we go into Timmy's room. How wonderful it is. The air conditioning going, of course. Feeling table. like I sense her in, in that room. Really Looking at her writing on the wall what's left of uh, her collage that she had done on the wall. And up to a point, I feel like I know exactly the spot where she was lying, because when I came back, I could identify that spot. So it has got that kind of special meaning for me.
A man accused of strangling his former girlfriend pleads not guilty to second-degree murder. This even though court papers filed by prosecutors say Michael Cordero told a nurse in the presence of police that he tried to commit suicide because he killed his girlfriend. Cordero is being held without bail in the psychiatric ward at Rikers Island. Police say he admitted to strangling and smothering 20-year-old Boitomelo McCallum after getting into an argument. It has been 18 long months, learning a lot in the process and uh, getting to understand more of how the justice system works which is something I never knew or anticipated that I would have to deal with at any stage in my life. It has been a very, very long journey, which I would like to see coming to an end so that for that part of it, I can put it to rest and just focus on where I am and what has happened to me and my family. You, you, I mean, one wants some kind of justice. I suppose it's, it's to be able to, to find some sort of closure, a, a particular kind of closure and justice. I feel there's no justice generally and you cannot get absolute justice. It's impossible. You will get some kind of justice. When I compare it with South Africa, there's no way that the changing of the whole situation in South Africa and the turning over of power and uh, achieving democracy has undone the injustice of the past. It's just too much to do. So it's more of other ways of ensuring or up to a point making sure that the same kind of thing doesn't happen to another person. I've learned in some ways that um, I will get what I would regard as satisfactorily justice, because satisfactorily justice is if my child is not dead. Whether it's a death sentence, a life sentence, or a number of years, there are certain things that are not going to change. She's not going to rise from the dead and be alive again. Maybe I should go with where fate is pushing me and not where I decide that's where I want to be. So I'm, I am here and I'll wait for the moment that's right that says I should go or shouldn't go. And I always said to, to me, the most important thing is to be happy in your life, is to be able to love and to be happy and to be loved. And uh, it's something that I've always strived for, you know, um, you know, once I even got to America, it's, it's, well, you know, what makes me happy? What do I want to do? What do I enjoy doing? Teaching in an elementary school, teaching art. My grandmother's birthday is February 8th. She really wants us to So we're going to, what's the time? We've got 50 minutes. You're going to have to work really hard. And I think you, it's possible that you can manage. Okay, so, so here we are. So we keep a track of all the pieces. So my suggestion is that you go... What do you think? What do you think? You like them? What, what do you think of this much? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>